Windsor, Sault Ste. Marie, Toronto, Sudbury, Woodbridge. If you wanted a list of places where Italian Canadians have made significant contributions to Ontario over the past century plus, it would include every corner of this province. And their stories from the newly arrived to multi-generational families all help tell our story. We are pleased that it brings a full house here to share some of that history with us tonight. And with that, we welcome Belinda Lelli, a Toronto realtor and first-generation Italian-Canadian. Gianna Patriarca, writer and poet, whose latest book, All My Fallen Angelas, is a short story collection about the lives of Italian-Canadian women. Rocco Rossi, president, CEO, Prostate Cancer Canada, whose first family ancestor arrived at Pier 21 in 1951. Danny Viotto, principal of De La Salle College in Toronto, who recently moved here after a lifetime in Sault Ste. Marie. Liam Gerussi, a musician whose great-grandparents came to Canada in the 1920s, and Marco Gallini, a business student at the University of Toronto and second-generation Italian-Canadian. Welcome, everybody, to Chin Radio. I'm your host, Johnny <laughs> Lombardi. <laughs> <laughs> Buonasera. It's great to have everybody here. Let's no, set no, up. No, 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 no. <laughs> We're starting already. Are we? Here we go. I want to just read this from Heritage Toronto to get our discussion started. Mr. Director, if you would, please. During the period from the 1950s to the 1960s, 40% of all those who emigrated from Italy to Canada came to Toronto. Family sponsorship and changes to Canadian immigration policies facilitated this immigration and rapid economic growth provided the employment opportunities. From a pre-war population of approximately 16,000, the Italian community in Toronto grew to 300,000 by the 1980s. In the midst of this wave of immigration, Italians in the city would redefine their place in the city's cultural fabric. Okay, let's get into this. Rocco, start us off here. How many waves of immigration to Canada were there, you know, from Italy? Well, there was no cannoli when Cabotto came, so he had to go back. <laughs> uh, we had uh, some come as early as the 1830s, but really mass scale immigration started in the 1870s. There was a wave until the First World War. Uh, and there was particularly in, in the Toronto area, you see a lot of the Friulani who came after the earthquake in the northeast of uh, Italy around the turn of the century. Um, immigration basically stopped in the Great Depression uh, and really didn't kick off again until after the Second World War. And then you had the massive um, growth of, of immigration really from the 50s to the 70s. And that's when your first relatives came over, right? Post-World War II. Yeah, that was when my uncle Gaetano, who was the first from our village, and that was 1951. And at that time, it wasn't family uh, sponsorship. You were sponsored by the country. So when you arrived at Pier 21... Who's that in that picture there, Rocco? Uh, that's Gaetano. That was one of his early jobs with Miller Paving uh, here in southwestern Ontario and uh, really the patriarch of our family. Um, he, uh, it all started I, with him, eh? It all started with him, and at Pier 21, when you came and you were sponsored by the country that was looking for laborers, uh, your passport was stamped with either an F or an M. Uh, and F meant that the train was going to drop you off in a farming community, and M meant that they were going to drop you in a mining community, and that's why you have a lot of Italians in the Sioux and in Sudbury and so on, because they were from that early wave. He was marked with, uh, with an F. They checked his hands for calluses, as he said, to, to ensure that he wasn't a vagrant. Uh, and he was dropped off in Ajax, Ontario, uh, and worked his way slowly through farming jobs to, uh, to Toronto. Fantastic. Belinda, let's get into your story here. How did your ancestors end up here? Well, my parents came over here in 1965 from Buenos Aires on a plane. So their experience is a little bit different in that they had already immigrated to Argentina from Italy, I guess post-war. They would be 80 today, okay, just to put it in perspective. And we settled in Etobicoke with my mom's family um, in a very Canadian community. And why did they want to leave South America? They basically followed my mom's family. Um, she was an Esposito, by the way, a lot of relatives in uh, the Sioux. Seriously? Yeah. Related to the hockey yes. players. Okay. Yes. And so um, they just heard great things about Toronto. My parents really adopted Trudeau's philosophy of multiculturalism. And um, This for the kids, we should say, is the Trudeau kids. the father, no. not yeah. the current no. Trudeau. No, <laughs> that's right. Pierre. Pierre, okay. thank you. Yes. Got it. All right, Marco, how does your family end up in Canada? Well, uh, my family's from Rome, so uh, a little bit different. They're from a big city. And uh, my nonno came here in uh, 
1955 um, to start uh, in the construction industry. And uh, soon after, in 1959, he, uh, I don't know how he did it, but he convinced my nonna to come here. And uh, she came here in 1959, and they got married uh, a couple weeks later. Um, Who's in this picture here? Uh, that's actually, uh, that's Niagara Falls. Uh, that's my nonna and my nonna. That's right after they got married in 1959. Grandparents. Yep, grandparents. Gotcha. Now, you're a little bit different from everybody else here in as much as, what do we say, you're half Italian? Half Italian, yes. And the other side my is? My mother's Indian. So you are half Italian, half Sikh? Yes. Okay, um, which side wins, if I can put it that way? <laughs> uh, well, growing up, I think that the Italian side of my family had a lot more influence just on my childhood and the way I was raised. But, um, and also because we go back to Italy every year, uh, I'm much more in contact with my relatives there than, uh, than my Indian side. But, uh, you know, like both sides are very like relevant in my life and I celebrate both traditions. Terrific. Jana, how about you? What's your story? Oh, my goodness. Um, my father came in 1956. Uh, and left my mother, my sister, and I in Italy. And uh, so we were without him for about four or five years until we joined him in 1960. I was eight years old at the time. So we came through um, uh, Pier 21, landed in Halifax, uh, a two-day uh, two train ride. Do you know why Toronto. he picked Canada? Well, it was pretty much like Rocco was saying, my uncle um, came in 1951. And my uncle, who came on his own as a young man, uh, eventually, um, I, I suppose, started calling his relatives over. And slowly, um, uh, the brothers and um, you know the family started to come over. But it all began in 1951, when my uncle John uh, came here as a young man and labored and um, slowly started to call his family. Was over. he really called John? Well, I call him my Uncle John, but it was Giovanni. Giovanni, <laughs> certamente. Okay. Danny, yeah. let's hear your story. Uh, my parents met in uh, Sault Ste. Marie, and they were married in Sault Ste. Marie. So they're, the way uh, their families um, made it to Sault Ste. Marie are two very different stories. My father um, is one of nine children, so he was born in Italy. And at the age of 18, uh, he got on the boat and came across. And uh, it was a pretty treacherous ride. It was 28 days. I guess the weather wasn't, uh, wasn't cooperating. So mm -hmm. he uh, was the first uh, and oldest child to uh, come to uh, Canada. And one by one, he brought all of his siblings uh, to, uh, to Sault Ste. Marie. And each one actually started living with him and, uh, and my mom. And, and that's, he's, uh, he's a contractor. He's a bricklayer. And uh, each brother that came uh, worked for him in his company. So All that was nine their siblings way. eventually made it. Actually, out. three of them stayed in uh, in Italy, but uh, six of them did. And uh, and then my grandfather um, and um, the youngest two came. Unfortunately, my grandmother passed away in Italy. Hmm. And on my mother's side, uh, my grandfather did come, uh, and uh, he came in uh, the late forties. And um, my mom and was um, born in Italy, and. Uh, her and uh, her sister were born at the time and made their way over uh, in the early 50s. And the youngest uh, was born in Sault Ste. Marie. So. Hi, yeah, I was going to say, how'd you end up in the Sioux? Well, my, my grandfather, funny story, he was uh, working in Thunder Bay and he had an injury. He was working on the railroad and he injured his foot badly. And they. That doesn't sound funny. They, they took him. Mm. Well, they took him to. Uh, <laughs> I didn't get to the funny part yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, he had to be taken to Toronto. And uh, at, while he was waiting in the hospital for treatment, someone was just talking to him and said, you have to go to Sault Ste. Marie. Sault Ste. Marie is hiring so many people. He, and after he was healed, he took a bus to Sault Ste. Marie, and that was his, that was his place. That's how he started in And Sault that's Sault how Marie. it happened. Yes. You know, uh, down in the south here, when we think of, quote, unquote, Italian cities in the province of Ontario, you know, the Sioux is pretty high up on the list. Okay. Is it really still that Italian a city? It really is. <laughs> it really, really is. Um, a lot of the the children of the immigrants have remained in Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, you're not hearing a lot of uh, talking Italian in the bakeries like you used to. The Italian masses, they're not as well attended anymore. Uh, but it was very, it's very traditional and uh, very highly populated with Italians. It's the same yeah. in, in Toronto, it's mostly the Filipinos now in the masses <laughs> in the old Italian churches. Mm -hmm. Well, I've left the guy with the very Italian name of Liam <laughs> to the end. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, Liam. <laughs> Liam, just before we get to you, uh, I do want to sort of set up uh, in part why we're having this discussion here because TVO is about to play after this program is over. 
the uh, North American television premiere of the documentary Revelstoke, A Kiss in the Wind. Let me just set this up. Italian filmmaker Nicola Moruzzi comes to Canada to find out what happened to his great-grandfather, who came here to work on the railroads back in 1913. Bit of a different story from some around this table. And he is meeting the descendants of another Italian immigrant who knew his great-grandfather. That's the setup to the clip we're going to see for the doc that will air immediately after this program. So, Sheldon, roll the clip, please. So what we're opening today is a copy of our family tree, so of the Berezal family history. So we have two Berezal families here, and one in Ontario, one in Brazil, one in Argentina. Um, and each year we get together, we have a family picnic, and all the people who are on this chart and more uh, come to the picnic. Well, here I have, uh, this is our local Italian paper, L'Eco d'Italia. This is 1976. That was uh, when the Barazal family in British Columbia first got together as a, a kind of a reunion. It was arranged by our father, Emilio, who ran the Ferguson Point Tea House in Stanley Park. And uh, here you see Toby. Here he is here. <laughs> he was uh, six years old. So how does it feel to be part of... Uh a huge family tree. It gives you a powerful sense of belonging. And it's not just to a powerful family here, but the roots of the, the origins of our family in Italy gives us a, a real strong sense of connection with, with the past, which makes us all feel good. Liam, any familiar echoes there? Well, it's funny. So my family, um, came uh, through in the 1920s. My great-grandmother took the train all the way west and her brother was in Lethbridge. Um, and then my great-grandfather, they met there. And uh, my great-grandfather was a, a stonemason in Lethbridge. So um, I felt like that was, the, I should have made that movie. That's, that's a great <laughs> idea. Um, this, this is not meant to be a critic. Well, actually, before I get to that question, Ch check out this picture here. Who do, who do we see in this picture? So I, I don't know everyone in the picture, but it's the Italian community in Eckshaw, which is uh, a tiny little mining community outside of Calgary um, on the old Highway 1. And um, the second from the left in the top row is my great-grandfather. That's your great-grandfather. Yeah. Any idea when that picture would have been taken? Um, that's a good question. I think this would have been uh, the kind of uh, probably around 1930, 31, 32. Because hmm. um, my grandparents, they got married in Lethbridge, and then they moved, to, they moved to Medicine Hat. My grandfather was born in Medicine Hat in 1928, and then they moved to Exshaw, and my grandfather grew up in Exshaw. This is not meant to be a criticism, merely an observation, but you don't really present as an Italian. Do you know what I'm saying? We, we I mean, we grew up very, um, my, so my, yeah, I'm only half Italian. I'm a half Italian, quarter Scottish, and the other quarter is uh, French Huguenot, so it's, we're very, very white, old, old still school Canadians. Um, uh, I guess uh, we didn't, we never grew up with that like Italian community. But it's funny because I've now married into it. My wife is Italian, and um, there, it, it's the food is just a little bit richer. There's a little more that has been care passed on for generation. I think, um, whereas yeah, my Italianness is has been a little bit uh, lost over the generations. Can I ask uh, Sheldon, our director, to put a super up button of this guy's? picture for a second because I think people who have been around for a while may recognize the last name and who your grandfather is. Yep. Tell us. So that's my grandfather, Bruno Gerussi. Um, he the was Beachcombers. Beachcombers, yep. It was a big hit. He was one of the, so I mean that's, a, he was one of the first um, Italian Canadians to be on TV and um, a lot of people who still will recognize my name will say, you know, I saw that, I saw Bruno on the Beachcombers, and that was a big thing because it was he was, but also a great actor on the stage at Stratford. Mm -hmm. Phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Now, if that weren't enough, <laughs> who's your other grandfather? Uh, yeah, you got a you got a still of him too. Go Come ahead, okay. Sheldon. <laughs> pop it up there. Look at that. Look who his other oh, grandfather is. Yeah. <laughs> Pierre Burton. How did uh, that happen? Uh, they, I, they my parents met randomly at a um, free school at Everdale in um, just outside in Ontario. So, so that's, uh, I don't know how that happened. <laughs> <laughs> Presumably the way it always happens. Yeah, the way it always happens. <laughs> well, in that's... a canoe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Very Canadian. From what I remember. Very Canadian. <laughs> well, let me read something. If there's one word that, um, I, 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 
do you feel Italian or do you feel more like a manja cake, if I can use that expression? <laughs> I do I feel like both, yes. yes. I do feel like a manja cake. Um, I was told I wasn't allowed to say that on TV. Though. Well, <laughs> you're, you're, you're allowed to say it because I'm about to say it yeah. several times as I read this next comment here. Go ahead, Sheldon. Let's put this next one up. Manja cake is still a popular term for those who don't know it. I heard it all the time in the 1990s and 2000s while growing up in Cambridge, Ontario. When I was younger, I'd often ask my parents what it meant. They couldn't really explain it to me, but as time went on and the examples mounted, I began to understand. The kids who made fun of me for my complicated name were manja cakes. The neighbors who had cottages, as well as grandparents who spoke perfect English and had university degrees, were manja cakes, too. Their families resembled what I saw on TV, while mine seemed like an anomaly, dysfunctional and strange. At first, I felt like my family's foreign roots and different language and customs meant we were less civilized. But as time went on, this flipped, and I became proud of the environment I grew up in. Davide Mastrici from Maisonneuve uh, earlier this year. Uh, okay, Rocco, how, how different did you think your upbringing was from the other WASPy kids that you perhaps might have known growing up? Well, um, first of all, my, uh, my uncle really decided to, um, um, to buy his first house in the east end of Toronto, not in the west end. It would have been a lot easier for him and the family to shop and and work in Italian and... Because uh, Little Italy's he, in the West part. Yeah, but he, he decided early on when he was looking for a house that uh, the schoolyards in the West End, all the kids were speaking Italian um, at recess. And he said, I want my children to be proud of their heritage, but I want them to learn English because that's how they're going to succeed. So he bought a house in a Scotch-Irish working-class neighborhood uh, in the Upper Beach. And we were different because... We were into urban agriculture way before <laughs> anyone else was. We the gardens grew, in the backyard, We right? grew in the backyard. We had uh, rabbits. We had chickens. Uh, kind of freaked the neighbors out a little bit uh, when it came to tomato sauce time or wine time. Um, but, but the neighbors got to understand that this was where the great food was. This was where the great parties were. Uh, and um, it certainly... One of the main differences with, with my Anglo friends was just the notion of personal space. It really doesn't exist growing up in an Italian <laughs> household where you're cheek to jowl with everyone, where you have multi-generations. You know, our grandparents lived with us. We had various aunts and uncles come through as we sponsored families. And uh, it was just a, a phenomenal time growing up. Belinda, does this sound familiar? Yes. <laughs> Having uh, grown up in Etobicoke, but if... Um... Who here uh, has been to Woodbridge lately? We later moved to Woodbridge, and Woodbridge was a complete difference from Etobicoke. How so? I went from having a class full of Doug, Keith, and Sean to like Vincenzo, Gianluca, and Maria <laughs> Teresa. I mean, <laughs> Porto de Leño. It's Porto, not Porto de Leño. Like, and it was so different. Like, I wasn't used to it. Everyone in the class was Italian. Different better, different worse? Oh, it, it's just different. I don't want to say, it, I just wasn't used to it because I went from a very Anglophone area, right, to a very Italian cocooned insular community. And it was, we moved there in 1978, 80, uh, 79. And at the time, Woodbridge is not what it is today. Right. There were two Catholic schools, one church, St. Margaret Mary, where I ended up getting married. And like Molly's on a bakery, one grocery store. And I moved from having like Dominion and Loblaws to Valencia Foods and Western Produce. I, I, I'll be honest, it was mm. very different. Uh, um, let's get a wide shot here for a second, Sheldon. I want to thank you. I want to find out whose parents spoke to them in Italian at this table. Hands up. Okay, not the two on the ends. So English so and your... My, yeah. So, well, I'm a fourth generation Canadian, so you have to think of it as like it's my grandparents, so Bruno and his wife, spoke to, when they... Wanted, didn't want their kids to know what they were saying. They would speak Italian to each other. <laughs> so, so my parent, my dad never learned Italian. So then I never learned Italian. So, but didn't you want to learn Italian yeah, just so you could understand yeah. what it's, the secrets were? I mean, were? it's on my list. But um, <laughs> it's on the list. Yeah. Papa, how about you? <laughs> yeah. So uh, my parents never spoke to me in Italian, but unless it was they were yelling. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I was surrounded by the language, so I have an understanding for it, but they just never pressured me, and, and I'm upset at them for that, But because uh, <laughs> I'd love to learn the language. But uh, no, they, they never spoke to me in Italian, and uh, no, I regret not learning it as a child now. Jana, what role did Italian have in your home? Oh, it still does. 
It still does. My mother is 92, and that's exclusively the only language we, we communicate in. Does, does she speak English? She speaks, uh, you know, a sort of English. You know, having spent 30 years in factories, she came home speaking Greek, Portuguese, Spanish, every other language hmm. but English because she worked uh, among all these other immigrant women from different ethnic groups. But no, Italian is very much an organic language in my life. It's still very, very alive. Rocco, how about growing up in your home? How much Italian, how much English? Um, all Italian until I started um, school. I didn't speak English except what I heard on, on television. Um, Wait a sec, you did not speak English? English until I started school. And then they couldn't shut me up once I learned <laughs> it. But, uh, and it was, um, it made for uh, some difficult times for my mom. Um, you know, it's nobody's fault, just the way things were. She came, was married to her childhood sweetheart uh, in 1961, had uh, me in 62, and then my four sisters in rapid succession. Hmm. So, you know, five kids, toddlers, there she is, Domenica. Uh, just celebrated her uh, 75th birthday this week. Auguri. Grazie tante. <laughs> and, um, and so through no fault of her own, uh, basically became a bit of a prisoner in her own home. We were in an Anglo neighborhood. Uh, she didn't speak English. She wouldn't, unless she recognized the person at the door, wouldn't open it, wouldn't answer the phone. Um, and one day I remember she, um, she went on the old Danforth streetcar to go grocery shopping, uh, but she missed the stop. And she didn't know enough English to be able to tell the, the driver to stop. So she, she rode the whole thing a couple of times until it came back uh, to where she could get off. But um, then a, a fantastic uh, Maltese woman um, from uh, the Y, funded by the United Way, came to the door and English as a second language courses. and. It really changed her life, changed all of our lives. My grandmother, who lived with us, and uh, you, you say about grandma not, not knowing much English, my grandmother, Antonia, firmly believed that if you spoke slowly enough and loudly enough in Italian, <laughs> everyone would understand you eventually. That's kind of true, though. Yeah, isn't it? it is. <laughs> it's kind of true. Hey, uh, can I impose upon you to do something? Yes. I mean, this is your poetry that I just so happen to have right here. <laughs> would you mind sharing? I mean, you. you you wrote oh, this. this. Would you mind sharing yes. this with us? This is an excerpt from uh, College Street, which is a much longer poem, but I'll read just a couple of pieces from it. We learned the language quickly, to everyone's surprise, and my mother embraced her new life in long factory lines, while my father continued his pleasures in pool halls, thick with voices of other men in exile. 1981, the Italians are almost all gone, to new neighborhoods, modern towns. My father is gone. The Bar Italia has a new clientele. Women come here now. I come here and I drink espresso and smoke cigarettes. And from the large window that swims in sunlight, I think I see my father leaning on the parking meter, passionately arguing soccer scores. How strange this city, sometimes, it seems so much smaller than all those towns we came from. That so beautifully captures a Thank place you. and a time. Congratulations, that's beautiful. Thank you. I wanted to follow up on a couple of words, though, that you said there. In exile. Yes. Why in exile? The pool halls were the exile for all those immigrant men. Uh, my, my father and all his buddies and the card playing and the, you know, the loose change spent at the, the espressos and cigarettes and all of that, you know, they, they, um, that's where they connected. It's where they, uh, I suppose, talked about their past. Um, perhaps it was a refuge from facing the present or the mm. future. And um, often my mother would send me, go call your father, it's time to eat, <laughs> you know? So I'd go to the pool hall and sort of walk through this uh, incredible, you know, smoke uh, cigarettes mm -hmm. and, you know, all these men playing cards and talking and this energy. So, yeah, I suppose I felt that they were in exile, exile from their, mm -hmm. from their past. I know it was an yeah. exile in another way. If you looked at some of those early on in the third wave, 
um, uh, but, but also in the second and the first wave, many of the Italians who came uh, expected to work for a couple of years, make money, yes. and then go back. And, go home. Mm. Uh, and, and some did. <laughs> um, you know, my great grandfather, uh, Gaetano Rossi as well, came with his two brothers to Boston in 1905. Uh, and they worked for a few years and made money and went back. Yes. Would have been very different, obviously, uh, for, for the family. And my, my uncle certainly expected that as well, but came to love the country and saw that the opportunity for his children here would be far greater than anything that he'd left. Rocco, I have to follow up on that. Who, who in your judgment, made the better decision? The ones who stayed or the ones who went back to the homeland? Um, I, I, well, I believe in the ones who, who stayed um, because obviously I'm, I'm, I'm a, the child of one of those uh, and, um, and I'm biased that way. But uh, there's no question, you know, my, um, uh, my mother's parents remained in, in Italy because they had three younger sons um, who by the time they were of an age that they could leave, it was far easier simply to go to Switzerland or Germany or France to work within the EU and be able to spend your summers still back in, in Italy. And uh, they too uh, expected that they would work in Switzerland and Germany for a while and then you know, they built their homes in the, in the village and, uh, um, and they will never go back because their children married in yeah. the country where they went and now they have grandchildren and uh, and so life moves on. Right. Danny, I wanted to, just evoking the poem we just heard, find out whether that world still exists in the Sioux, where sort of the older generation hangs out in pool halls and little social clubs and watch, watches soccer games on black and white TVs and <laughs> smokes and <laughs> still hangs out. Does that world still exist? It, it does. There's a, a place called the Marconi Club in Sault Ste. Marie, which was, which was built by you know, the Italians um, many years ago. And it's still there. And many, many um, families, uh, couples um, have celebrated many events, their weddings and baptisms and anything you can. The food is outstanding. If you were open the kitchen, you just saw, you, you see a bunch of, you know, uh, Italian women, uh, you know, they, they still make the handmade ravioli one by one each for weddings of hundreds and hundreds. And, and they still have cultural uh, parties. Like they'll have a Fulan party, they'll have a Calabres party, they'll have a rabbit party. Men are only allowed to the rabbit party still. They haven't you know, crossed that line too. Um, There's no such thing as bad Italian food, is there? I mean, I've certainly I, never oh, yeah, had there any. Is. There is? <laughs> I don't well, think I've ever was, had any. Most so, of it is being cooked in this city. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was so funny when I, for my parents' 50th, uh, my wife and I took them back um, to Italy. We did actually a bit of a European tour and we were in Paris. and took the train to Rome and stopped in Piemont uh, in Asti. And, uh, and my parents literally could not recognize the food. There wasn't a tomato to be found. It was all <laughs> cream sauces. And, you know, we, we blithely talk about the Italians, but the reality is that you have wide variation within the community. You have communities within the communities because the Fami Frugliani, uh, very, very uh, different when they're speaking in their dialect I maybe understand one in every four, uh, four words uh, because of the Slavic and Germanic uh, influence there. And similarly, there the is. Italian I speak is the Italian of you know, a 10-year-old uh, who speaks in the dialect of Puglia. And when I speak in, in, uh, in Italy, they, it's kind of amusing because some of the words only the children of immigrants and the very old still speak those variations mm -hmm. of the language. Actually, when I go back to my hometown, and I, and I do quite regularly, the locals are always really freaked out when they hear me speak the, the dialect. I call it dialect, but it's, it's our first language because it is so authentic to what my mother brought with her in the 60s and they just where did you learn that we don't <laughs> speak that here anymore you know but there is this renaissance in italy now for um uh, learning the the dialects and a lot of the writers are actually writing 
poetry and, and uh, works in dialect, which I find really exciting. Because for me, I write in the three languages. I write in English, in my dialect, and in Italian. Mm -hmm. And I think it's wonderful to be able to have three different sensibilities of language and rhythm and tone to be able to tell your stories. Let yeah. me introduce a new, uh, somewhat more controversial subject to our discussion here, and that is marriage. I want to find out, Liam, to you first. You happened to marry into an Italian-Canadian family. I did. Was yeah. there pressure on you from above to do so? I don't think so. Um, but again, I think I was more of the manja cake than she, than she is anyway. So um, uh, it was, uh, again, for me, like I always identified as being Italian, even though I'm kind of the more watered-down generation. And so it's been, it's been really nice because I feel like... Um, I connect with some of my ancestors more, in a way, just to have that part of my life a lot. So, Belinda, how about you? There was pressure to marry a good guy <laughs> with good values. I ended up marrying an Italo-Canadian, but I didn't have I didn't have to marry an Italian. Was that a priority for you? No. No, I went to the University of Toronto, but I have to tell you, people from my generation in their 40s, the only way you could leave home was to get married. <laughs> So I want to mm. offer that, like, you couldn't go live on your own until you got married proper. Now that's an Italian thing. Yes. Okay. Is that what you did? Yes. So you got married quite young? 25. 25. Okay, well that's not yes. super young. Okay. Pretty 20. much after I graduated. <laughs> gotcha. Yes. And, but you never sort of felt that pressure from your parents to marry an Italian? No. They wanted me to marry uh, a gentleman with my values, like a good work gotcha. ethic, believed in God worked hard. I guess they preferred it, but they never really said that. They know. Okay, gotcha. How about over on this side of the table? Anybody? Not right. married yet. <laughs> Not married yet, okay. <laughs> Have you ever heard any, either of your parents say, we would sure love you to marry within the tribe, so to speak? No, no, but, well, as you said before, my mom's Indian, so uh, there's no pressure on me at all. <laughs> really? Yeah. On either side? On either side. To go either way? No. Okay, good. How about you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I see you I'm are. Honest, uh, <laughs> I said my you... wife is Italian and Greek, so um, it, it it was just because it was easier, and our families get get along easier. The cultures would be similar. It was more along those lines, and um, it it was just uh, they just when I brought home a girlfriend who was Italian or Italian Greek, they they moved to the top, you know, rung. It was like, oh, this is a good girl, you know, stay with her. So, and and being Italian, you're under pressure all the time. Uh, on, under many circumstances, for everything, for everything you have. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah, so. How would guilt it, is the power guilt. that finds <laughs> yeah. Italian yeah. My, my parents are gonna watch this, so I didn't want to say the guilt part. No, no. <laughs> yes, the guilt I'm, I'm just wondering, how, how would they make their views on this issue known to you? Uh, by telling me? Yeah. <laughs> they would just, was, like, if you brought home, uh, say, a, a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant girl, they would say, don't do that again? No, 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 no. absolutely not. No, no, no. They weren't. Okay. They weren't to that extreme. It was just, you know, oh, you know, Danny, this is nice. Oh, look how good. Did you notice that she did? Oh, did you? And then, <laughs> yeah, oh, it was like bringing her to, you know, to, like I said, to the to accentuate the, top the positive. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Well, Mr. Rossi, sir. Yeah, I uh, I broke my mom's heart. <laughs> um, I I am the first non-Irish. Uh, married into my uh, wife's family, Ronnie, and she's the first non-Italian into. Uh, into ours. In fact, when I met uh, her, uh, her late mom, uh, Faith, uh, for the first time when I uh, asked her permission to court her, her daughter, uh, I introduced myself as Rock O'Rossi. Uh, <laughs> and she thought that was, uh, that was good. Uh, not only is she Irish, but she's Irish Protestant. So being married in a Protestant church was actually harder than the fact that it wasn't Italian. If it had been non-Italian but Catholic, uh, and then, on top of that, not only not a Catholic church, but then we were going to have a very small wedding. And, you know, in our family, it's very difficult because the moment you extend beyond the nuclear family to the first cousins, you know, you're 300 people. Uh, and, and she'd always wanted a big, big wedding for her son, and that wasn't that wasn't going to happen because uh, my wife's family was very small. But all was forgiven. Uh, when her first grandson was born on uh, my father's birthday. No uh, kidding. And, hmm. and we continued with the tradition of naming uh, the first son after the paternal grandfather. So 
It's all good. So your son's name is? Dominico. DJ, uh, although to this day my, my mom still calls him DG. Uh, <laughs> the J was, uh, was my wife's uh, decision to bring an Anglo element into, mm. uh, into the name to Dominic John. Um, but, uh, and we should explain, you, Ronnie is not short for Veronica. You no, better spell Ronnie. It is Ronnie, R-H-O-N-N-I-E. Uh, so Ronnie as in rhinoceros, as she says. Uh, <laughs> she says that? Yes. Really? Yeah. Okay, well, I've met her before, yeah, so, yeah, you know, sure. but I won't say no anything about that. No messing around. No. I grew up in the 60s and 70s, and good Italian immigrant girls didn't stray far from, you know, hmm. the, uh, the, uh, the pack. So but, you, uh, you, it was expected of you that you would marry? Not expected, yeah. but just assume that it would happen. But, um, you know, I was... a a bit rebellious, and uh, I, I went as far south as you could possibly get, and I married a New Zealander. So, <laughs> <laughs> but my parents were absolutely thrilled. As a matter of fact, they fell in love with him more than, <laughs> than they did with me. New so. Zealander, not of Italian background. No, no, no Scottish, uh, okay. I guess, Scottish in, in you know. But, um, yeah, so it, it wasn't uh, common, let's say, in mm. the 70s for immigrant girls to, you know. Gotcha. But, Danny, you got kids? Mm -hmm. I do. What, what expectations do you have of your kids as to whether they do or don't, you know, pick up on your Italian heritage, follow some of the Italian values, marry into another Italian, all that stuff? Um, <clears throat> they're very, still very young, so we don't talk anything about relationships, boyfriends or anything. They're only seven, sorry, nine and 11. Okay. So um, that, that's not something I want to start talking about, but no. <laughs> uh, but moving forward, um, again, it would be similar to just, just making sure that they they have someone who really cares about them and anything a good parent would want for their child. Right. So, yeah. Belinda, you got kids? Yes. And? Jack and Daniel, 15 and 13. They Jack play hot. Jack and Daniel. Those are not exactly Italian names. No. Jack and Daniel. And Giacomo? Giacomo? No, it's Jack. <laughs> <laughs> and my dad was happy I picked those names. But you um, purposely, obviously, did yes. not pick Italian sounding names for your kids. Yes. How come? Because I didn't, I, I don't know. You know what? There were two grandfathers. If you pick one and not the other, and they're both Italian, so is it going to be Giordano or is it going to be Anthony? So you go neutral, and they like the names. And so, insofar as relationships, they they both go to an all boys school. We were talking earlier, St. Mike's, and you know what? I just want them to pick a really nice girl with, with, good, <laughs> with good values. Uh, more than likely, I don't know. Gotcha. Jack okay. And Daniel, that's a good one. Jack and Daniel. <laughs> oh, no. If you put it together, it's yeah. a really good Jack and Daniel? <laughs> no. I didn't even think of that. Good for you. Uh, so okay. then we have heavy drinks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the Tennessee. I, yes. <laughs> it's, not wine. it's not wine. No. <laughs> the Tennessee whiskey is flowing in your yeah, home. Is that right? It is. By the two, how old are the kids? 15 and 13. Don't give them ideas. A good age to start drinking Jack Daniels. Okay. Let's go, uh, Sheldon. Let's, can we go to the bottom of page five here, chapter four? Let's bring up, um, okay, let's do, so. we, we have to talk ter stereotypes. I'm sorry, but we just do. So let's start with this. Uh, can we bring up picture 19A, please? Big vegetable gardens. <laughs> how much of this is myth and how much of this is still accurate? Tell us. Uh Oh, no, it's accurate. That's my mother's garden. <laughs> I don't know. That's my mother's garden. <laughs> it could be my mother's could be garden. Both. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, at 92, she's still out there digging and, yeah. and planting those uh, plants and, and loving taking care of it. Yeah. So this is still a real thing? Yeah, it's a real thing. Okay. How about plastic covered sofas? That's <laughs> not real. No. Not that, a thing. It was. Never. It was in our, it was in our family. Scorsese we had, films. no, no, no. <laughs> this is, this is the Rossi household, the main floor. God help you if you sat on that sofa. We lived in the basement, the kitchen. I mean, it was, it was a surreal experience, but it was. It's an easy stereotype. Look at, yeah. it's, it was my life. Uh, and, and it was, a source of pride. I mean, much as the West Coast Indians have the tradition of potlatch where they put in their goods into a canoe, set it on fire, and send it down the river, for us it was the main floor and the weddings for your daughters. I mean, these are massive things, hundreds of people. Families go into debt to, uh, to do that because it's a, it's a symbol of making it in, in society. And you really were not allowed to sit on that sofa? Was not allowed to sit on that on sofa. On pain of? Well, you know, just uh, up, upside the head. Yeah, really, really. It was like that. 
Okay, uh, Sheldon, number 20, please. The Godfather and the Sopranos. The movies. There's uh, Jimmy Gandolfini. These are May he rest in peace. Yes. Uh, but a phenomenal... Yeah. And there, of course, Marlon Brando, one of the greatest actors ever. Uh, the and Godfather Francis movies. Ford Coppola, an Italo-American. Indeed. indeed, indeed. Okay, we like or we don't like the okay. way Italian-Americans are portrayed in that movie. Shoot, Can go. I the Godfather my parents really liked. So um, in terms of a stereotype, Christmas Eve is a big thing, right? Where you have fish and you open the presents on Christmas Eve and not Christmas Day. Christmas Eve, we're watching the Ten Commandments. Christmas <laughs> Day without fail, the Godfather. <laughs> so a huge sense of pride about the family, the loyalty aspect. No, The Sopranos, I'm not so much a fan, but my dad liked it. Like the Godfather? Well, uh, yes, and, and the Sopranos. Sopranos really? Yes, that, that was a really that was a harsh series. Eh? Yes, like very violent, yes. very brutal, lots of swearing. Yes. Did anybody? Anybody? Oh, go ahead. You tell uh, me. Well, Jill. I, I, you know, if you're looking at these things purely as uh, creative artistic projects by you know people who are uh, making films and directing, these are brilliant works of art. Absolutely mm -hmm. brilliant work. So but what our, do you think about the portrayal of the Italian-American experience? Well, it's unfortunate that, you know, uh, there are aspects of that portrayal that, you know, have some basis and have some truth. Mm -hmm. But you can't judge a work of art in terms of uh, um, uh, a social and, and um, uh, history. You have mm -hmm. to look at it as a work of art. Marka, how about yeah. the stereotypes that might be in either of those movies or that television series? Well, of course, I don't agree with them, but in those movies, especially The Godfather, I love The Godfather, but uh, there, there, there's a deep sense of family and pride, and that obviously comes with being Italian, but then obviously the other, the other stereotypes uh, just, I mean, they're entertaining, right? So mm -hmm. people like watching them, and like you said, it's a work of art, so. There are, there are stereotypes in that format that are really bad because they're badly done, they're badly conceived, badly written, badly acted, and those are the ones that I find offensive. Mm. But but these it, were very good. These like, these are on a different level. Yes. So uh, um, and then you know the um, we as Canadians have always sort of been tied to the American representation of who we are as Italians, right? Hmm. They have a much longer history, a much, and and their um, society has been formed so much by the Italian um, influence that it sort of rubs off on us, you know, we're very different from the Americans as mm. Italian Canadians, but sometimes we are just painted with the same brush. And so, you know, it wasn't all pizza and gangsters. It wasn't, <laughs> believe me, my books will tell you that it wasn't all pizza and gangsters, but unfortunately, that's what's romantic and that's what's sexy and that's what mm. sells. And so that's what, you know, That's represents. what you see portrayed, Yeah. right. We're literally down to our last minute and a half here, which is a shame because I'm, I think we're just getting warmed up actually. But what's interesting is y y your your backgrounds, your family backgrounds, all tell somewhat different stories. You came here at different times, different relatives, and so on and so forth. Your different generations. What would you guess that you all have in common around this table? Go ahead, Belinda. Passion, mm -hmm. passion for life, for people, for good food, for this country. Liam, what would you add to the list? Yeah, I would, I would go with that as well. I always get told when I get excited, I start talking with my hands. People say, stop being so Italian. <laughs> they, say, they, say that, I, I, they say, stop yelling. I say, I'm not yelling. I'm just passionate. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think that's definitely part of it. Rocco? A passion for sure and, uh, and a desire to be worthy of the sacrifice our parents and our grandparents made um, because it's remarkable. You know, there's all kinds of debates around immigration and, you know, people are going to take jobs or not. But quite frankly, there are millions of people, billions of people in these countries who've come from which uh, immigrants have come and they've stayed. It's been the ones who've had the courage and the hard work and the desire to better themselves who've come. And my God, I want a country filled with those people. That is just a superb place to leave our discussion tonight. I want to thank everybody for coming into TVO and sharing this buona festa this evening here. Um, auguri tun.
Auguri, auguri, tanti auguri. Una buona giornata. Grazie signora. Grazie. Ok, ci vediamo la prossima volta. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit tvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.